Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the HL extension for electric fields, um, mostly looking at topic 10.2. Uh, essentially, we're going to look at these equations. The good news, bad news here is that things with electric fields work mathematically almost exactly like things for gravitational fields. So it's just going to be a matter of applying these equations in a little bit of a different context. We're going to replace our big G's with K's and our M's with Q's and um, pretty much call it a day. But let's take a look at the most deadly, fun, crazy uh, table in the whole data booklet, this big topic 10.2 table. Um, we've talked about these four quantities for gravity. We have four very similar, uh, sometimes even the same kind of thing, equations for electric field related ideas. So we have four quantities here in this table. Uh, baseline thing you definitely, definitely, definitely want to do is memorize what everything in the data table is at a, at a bare minimum um, to kind of be successful on the exams. You definitely have to know what every variable is, what the units uh, are, especially for these are, are helpful, you know, what the variables represent. You want to know which of these are scalars and which of these are vectors so that when you see a problem that asks you about electric potential, you know that this is the equation to come to first, especially if it's electric potential, say, uh, due to a point charge some distance r away, because that's what this equation will give you. All right, so whatever method works for you to organize these in your mind, um, making uh, flashcards or, or annotating your data booklet um, are very helpful. So the units I find can be really useful in thinking about what's going on. So starting from the bottom, if we want, because this is the one we're maybe most familiar with, we have, of course, our equation for electric force. This is Coulomb's law. And the force between two charges, it's the Coulomb constant, K, in the front of your data booklet, um, times the product of the two charges. You, so you take each charge, the amount of charge of your, you know, point, point particle, multiply those two charges together in Coulombs, divide by the distance between them squared, and that'll tell you the force that they are pushing or pulling on each other with. This gives you a vector, of course, because it's a force. Do keep in mind this equation doesn't really give you a direction. You need to decide what the direction of the force is based on uh, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So you'll just need to look at the context of the problem for what the direction of the force is. They also give you an equation here for electric field strength. And I jumped to that because this is a force in Newtons and this is a field strength in Newtons per Coulomb. So closely related, if you will. This one, though, is just based on one charge, the charge creating a field. So there's not two charges interacting here. All right, so this equation tells us electric field strength. Notice electric field strength is a gradient of electric potential over distance, much like gravitational field strength is a gradient of gravitational potential versus distance. Remember the place we saw this most was in graphs of gravitational potential versus R, the classic VG versus R graph, where the thing to do with that graph is draw a tangent line on the graph, take the slope of that tangent line. The slope of that tangent line is equal in magnitude to the acceleration due to gravity, aka gravitational field strength at that distance from the object. You can do the same thing with electric fields. You might just see electric potential versus distance graphs, and the gradient of that graph is equal to field strength, officially negative field strength, just like before. Um, this can also be used more algebraically if you have a, a electric potential that changes over a distance. The common one is in parallel plate problems, and you can take the potential difference Divide by, say, the distance between the plates, that'll also tell you the strength of the electric field because that changes uh, linearly. Okay, the other electric field equation you want to remember, and whether you think about that here or in 5.1, ideally you think about it both places, remember we can do our definition of electric field is F over Q, force per unit charge, F over little q. Um, and so what we end up with is KQ over R squared equals E. That equation is not in the data booklet. Uh, that big E equals K times big Q over R squared. Make sure you know that you can do that. It's a very common equation that you need to use, and they don't really give it to you here. They expect you to combine this equation with the definition of electric field from topic 5.1, and the definition of electric field, and the first thing to think about probably when you're thinking about electric field is F over Q, force per unit charge, acting on a small test charge in at a point in a, in a field. Um, so yeah, KQ over R squared, another really useful thing. You can use it just like GM over R squared when we're using our gravity problems, gravity field problems. 
uh, especially in a ratio problem context, they love it. All right, of course, we also have the equation for potential energy between two charges. Multiply the Coulomb constant by the product of each charge divided by just R, not R squared. This gives me the energy stored uh, in the field due to the position of those two charges. In joules, of course, it's potential energy. And um, the other way I can do this is multiply Q by VE, because if we notice, uh, multiply this equation by a little Q and you get this equation. Uh, so VE is potential. And it's really potential energy per charge, joules per coulomb. This tells me the electric potential from a point charge Q, a distance R away from that charge. So think about the units, think about the variables, make sure you know what's what so that when you problem, see what the problem is asking you for, you know where to go, right? All right, here's some example problems that you can work through to make sure you can apply those equations. The first one, um, is dealing with these equipotential surfaces here. You wanna be comfortable with these. You do wanna know these patterns. Uh, this is a common one, two nearby negatives. There's two nearby positives. There's the electric dipole. There's parallel charge plates and a few others that are good to know. Um, but so the idea with equipotential is that these are lines of equal potential. And so everything along this circle is at minus 10 volts. Everything along this peanut shape is at minus five volts. And everything along this big oval minus two volts. All right, so we're dealing with electric potential, V sub E. So we wanna be thinking about uh, electric potential. And what we want is to find work. We want how much work will it take to move a negative one nanocoulomb test charge from point A to point B. Look in your data booklet at the other side of topic 10 in 10.1, there is an equation that will give you work based on charge and potential. It's a version of this equation, just doing it twice because of work, of course, Work is delta E, work is change in energy. In this case, the energy we're changing is potential energy because we're moving a, a charged object through an electric field. So we're changing its electric potential energy. So really I do final minus initial potential energy, um, which give me charge times final potential uh, minus charge times initial potential. We could also write that as Q delta V. And so if you look in your 10.1, you have an equation that potential work equals um, Q delta V. So all we need to do is multiply the charge, negative one nanocoulomb, by my change in potential. And the change in potential from A to B is final minus initial. So I would do negative two minus 10 to get a change in potential of eight volts. So I go up eight volts from A to B. So all we gotta do for this one is multiply eight volts by negative one nanocoulomb. I think that'll give me negative eight nanojoules. In other words, negative eight times 10 to the minus nine joules. That's how much work you do moving a charge from A to B. And it's negative because I'm moving a negative charge this way through an electric field. It wants to go that way naturally. So one way to say that is the charge does work on me if I move it from A to B. Now, if I moved it from B to A, I would surely have to do work pushing against the repelling electric force that would repel all negative charge from here to here. All right, and how much work to move it from point A to point C? Pause and think about that. The answer is zero because there's zero potential difference. So it takes zero work, no work, because there's no change in potential energy at the same um, potential energy, very similar to starting and ending at the same height in a gravitational potential energy problem. No work is done in total, right? So no work done from A to C. Here's another problem, a classic type of problem you might see. Um, where you have a couple of nearby point charges, you need to find a total potential. You wanna be comfortable with how you would find, say, the total electric field at P by sketching a couple vectors, adding them tip to tail, sketching a result. But if I wanna find total potential, what I need to think about is that potential is a scalar. So something like this is not too difficult. It's uh, kind of plug and chug into the equation here, but we wanna just think about uh, adding potential as a scalar is the main idea and concept to be okay with here. So the equation for electric potential says the potential uh, at a point due to a nearby charge is this much. So I take my Coulomb constant and multiply by the charge. So I'm just considering this first one here. I'll call this charge one and I'll call this charge two. So I'm just gonna do the potential from charge one first. I'm gonna treat, do these separately and then add them together. So I multiply the Coulomb constant from the front of the data booklet by the charge. I got four pico coulombs. That's how much a pico is. Also, of course, in the front of your data booklet, get you familiar with it. Um, and two centimeters, I gotta make it meters. So there we go. I end up with 1.8 and the units, of course, are volts. 
Uh, potential is fun. It's one of the only things where the symbol and the unit are the same. V equals plus 1.8 V. So 1.8 volts is the potential from this charge. I need to also consider the potential from the negative 2 picocoulomb charge. Same process. I'll get this. Negative 0.9 volts. And if I want the total potential, it's very easy because potential is a scalar. So don't let the don't let the uh, electric field practice get two in the way. Uh, you don't need to draw arrows or nothing. You just add them up. I got a positive and a negative. They're going to add to positive 0.9 volts. That's the potential at P. All right, you'll see lots of different arrangements of charges and things like this where you find the total potential. And that's all you do. Find the potential from each individual point charge and add them together. Um, keep in mind, depends on how far away they are, and the magnitude of each charge. And plus and minus for these scalars especially is really important. So just make sure you keep track of that. Okay, and last kind of miscellaneous topic 10 thing that we should talk about is very specific. But um, remember these equations all treat these charges as though they are point charges. So the equations in this table are all for point charges, charges where all the charge is located at a point in space. And almost always that's a good assumption unless we are inside of a charged object. If you think about our Van de Graaff machine experiments, it's a very good example of a charged sphere. And it's very similar to what we looked at that happens inside the center of the Earth, say, or a planet or a mass if you could go there. If you could hollow out the center of the Earth and hang out there, there would be no gravitational field, or the total gravitational field would be zero because you have an equal amount of mass pulling in all directions. Well, the same thing happens for a charged conducting sphere. If you're in the middle, there is an equal electric field uh, essentially pushing or pulling in all directions, pointing in or pointing out. Um, so there's no electric field inside of a conducting sphere. And no matter where you go, that's true. If I'm way over on this side, I have a strong electric field from these couple of charges, but I have a less strong electric field from all of this charge. And it turns out those things will always cancel out no matter where you go. You would need the methods of calculus to show that exactly, but um, it does work out. So no matter where you go inside of an electric charged conducting sphere, the electric field is zero the whole way. So if we were to plot electric field strength versus distance, it would look like this. This is going to line up with this graph. It's zero all the way inside of the conductor until we hit the radius of the conductor, at which point we're outside of it, and now our normal electric field equation will take over. The other thing that must be true, if this is true, is that the potential must be constant inside because remember, electric field strength is the gradient of potential. And the only way to have a gradient of zero is for the potential to be a horizontal line. So it turns out this is what potential looks like. So this is our graph of electric potential versus distance. This is our graph of electric field strength versus distance from the center of a conducting sphere out to its edge and beyond. All right, it's uh, very specific, but this is a specific case that they love to ask you about. Um, it's, a, it's one of the standards, in fact, that you can talk about what's going on inside of a charged conducting sphere. Most of the time, this is a paper one situation. They'll say, which one of these graphs shows what's happening with the electric field uh, inside of a charged conductor? And you pick the graph that looks like this, not the graph that looks like this or the other two fake out ones. Or they'll ask you for the potential graph or something like that. So really what you want to do is memorize these two graphs. It's a very specific case, um, but these are the two graphs you want to memorize. Outside of the conducting sphere, it immediately starts acting like a point charge. So if you're out here, to you, it looks like all of this charge is located at a point in space right here, and your normal equations will work. But inside of the sphere, it's a special case, and so you want to know about that special case. All right, so memorize these graphs. This is a graph for potential and electric field versus distance for a charged conducting sphere. So there you go. Those are the uh, big things that you need for the HL extension of electric fields. Uh, plenty of practice to be done with those, especially with these quantities. The best thing you can do is practice them a lot until you get familiar with all these, you know, difference between potential and potential energy and all that fun stuff. So get to practicing and have fun.